I know you've probably been wondering, where did this RSV virus come from? Has it always been around? And why am I hearing about it for the first time if it's always been around? And just how serious is this RSV infection anyway? Is there another push for vaccines? everyone. I thank you for joining. We are going to just go deep into this topic today because I know a lot of people have questions about it, not just the general population, but also the healthcare community as well. And things are evolving very quickly and you probably have a lot of very valid questions. And so our goal today is to answer and touch on some of the real, some of the key points. Are there equity issues that we should be mindful of? I'm going to touch on a lot of these questions today and hopefully answer some of your questions. But keep in mind that things are evolving very similar to the COVID experience where the information seemed to be initially a little confusing, just simply because the science was evolving to try to catch up with the um, issue itself. And so keep in mind that the information that's being provided is the information that's available in this time capsule. So we definitely advise you to uh, keep updated with some of your common resources, whether it's the CDC, uh, the American Medical Association, or the American Pediatric Association, for updated information regarding this. And just so you guys know, the target is really the high-risk groups, which we'll talk about today. So RSV, which is respiratory syncytial virus, is not new. This virus has actually been identified and known since the 1950s. So the question that most of you have is why does it seem to be a new topic now? What's different? And that's a great question. Well, some of you may be aware that last season we had what's called a triple-demic. So you've learned the word pandemic and epidemic. Now we're going to talk about triple-demic. So triple-demic means that there were three issues or three active issues at the same time. Last season, we noticed a rise in COVID infections. And at the same time, we were in the peak season for both influenza and RSV as well. And that led to an increase in hospitalizations. RSV typically for most will cause cold-like symptoms and usually is mild. Most people will feel better in about one to two weeks. But there are some individuals that will have severe disease, just similar to COVID. Just as a reminder, some people with COVID had very mild disease and some people were asymptomatic and other people had very severe disease, unfortunately. Just similar to the flu, some people have very mild cases of the flu, and some people have very severe complications. Now, there are certainly some groups that are more likely to have severe complications, which in this case includes our older population and our youngest. Specifically, our infants and our adults 60, 60 years and older are more likely to have higher rates of hospitalizations and complications related to the respiratory virus, RSV. Whenever we have an infection that can cause a massive effect on the general public, it usually garners attention um, for some type of immunization to protect the public, to prevent from what we just experienced with COVID, call a pandemic or even an epidemic. Some of you may be wondering, is it really that serious? If most people get mild symptoms, how serious is RSV? Well, RSV doesn't have as high a mortality rate as in, as the influenza virus, also called the flu, or certainly not as high as COVID, but it does warrant attention because of the high hospitalization rate. Let's go through the numbers. When we look at the most vulnerable population, our older adults and our youngest children, our infants, we know that the hospitalization rates are higher. Here's a key fact you should be aware of. RSV, the respiratory syncytial virus, is the number one cause for hospitalizations in infants. I'll say that one more time. RSV is actually the number one cause for hospitalization of infants. So it warrants a lot of attention, but let's go through some additional important numbers. It is responsible for 58,000 to 80,000 hospitalization of children less than the age of five annually. And it's responsible for 100 to 300 deaths annually. In our older population, the impact of severe disease is much more profound. Older patients, specifically those 65 years and older, are at high risk for hospitalization at numbers 
up to 60,000 to 160,000 hospitalizations per year and six to 10,000 deaths annually. RSV, similar to the flu, is actually seasonal. And the season starts in the fall, but really peaks in the winter. And this is why it tends to overlap with the other viruses, COVID, as well as influenza. And that's what leads to what we term a triple-demic. So how is RSV spread? Well, RSV, as mentioned, is a respiratory virus, respiratory syncytial virus specifically. RSV can be spread by droplets. Someone coughing or sneezing produces droplets, which can then land on somebody else's mouth, eyes, or nose, allowing for the passage of the virus into the body. RSV can also be spread by touching a surface that's infected with the virus. So I cough and I sneeze into my hand and I may touch a doorknob and then someone else comes along and touch the same doorknob and then touch their face. That can transmit the virus. Or I may be kissing my child on the face who is infected with the virus. Or they may be kissing a sibling and pass it on to a sibling. So those are the typical ways in which the virus is spread from one individual to another. The period of being contagious is really important. As mentioned, most people will recover from the infection one to two weeks, but there are some individuals that even when they do not have symptoms can still be contagious up to four weeks. The primary time period in which people are contagious, however, is between three to eight days of having their symptoms, but can also be contagious one to two days prior to the onset of symptoms. And as mentioned, symptoms are pretty typical for any respiratory infection. So the symptoms for RSV is similar to any other respiratory virus, including runny nose, cough, sneezing, fever, um, or even having a decrease in your appetite. But what are some of the warning signs, especially in children, uh, to tell you that they may be having more severe symptoms from RSV? So certainly the flaring of the nose, and I'm going to do it now, with breathing, is an indication that a child may be having some respiratory difficulty. Sometimes the signs are a little bit more obvious where you can actually see that they're having a hard time breathing or that they're breathing faster. If you see their abdomen going in and out, that may be a sign that they're working harder to breathe or sometimes looking at their rib cage and noticing that the muscles are retracting. Those are signs to contact your physician, your pediatrician, or go immediately to the hospital. So you guys know on this platform, we always make mention of equity issues so that we understand the importance to our communities. So specifically for black children, we know that there is a higher mortality rate of RSV related deaths compared to white children. We also know that the ICU admission rate is 1.2 to 1.6 times higher than white children. And for those who are under the age of two, we know there's a higher hospitalization rate for those in our Alaskan natives and American Indian communities. So it's even more critical for us to be able to have access to vaccines. But what about the fact that certain medical treatments and access has always historically been an issue for our communities? Well, the good news is that the Vaccine for Children program, which provides vaccines for underinsured or non-insured children, has included the immunization options for RSV, which includes the vaccination as well as the administration of monoclonal antibody. And we'll talk about those two coming right up. And before we continue, just a friendly reminder. Again, the RSV virus is seasonal and there are variations depending on where you live. So it's very important that, yes, take this information for an overview, but also pay attention to the information that's provided locally because rates and trends will vary depending on where you live. These are the national uh, recommendations, but certainly in your communities, locally, statewide, citywide, there may be variations in the recommendations based on the rates in your community and based on the risk factors in your community. In general, the RSV season is considered to be between September and January. So when we talk about the timing for administration, keep that time frame in mind. Given all that we've discussed, RSV definitely warrants our attention, and I think you probably will agree. And now that we understand why it's important that we're discussing this now in this time frame, now we can move on to where the hope is, right? So what are we learning and what do we know about ways to prevent RSV? Well, 
The most important ways to prevent RSV is sort of your very basic information that we've shared before, even before the pandemic. Washing your hands, staying away from people who are obviously ill, making sure that you use good hygiene practices. That's the foremost important is in preventing the acquisition of the infection is by following good hygiene behaviors, making sure you wash your hands for at least 20 seconds, whether you're singing the happy birthday song or something else to remind you of the adequate time. Make sure that you're covering all areas of your hands, avoiding touching your face, especially when in public. Those are the very basic and very effective ways of preventing yourself from and your family from being infected, not just with this virus, but any virus that's peaking in its season. So with immunizations, there's two approaches, right? There is the approach of vaccination, which is if you are the person being vaccinated and the intent is to prevent you from getting the infection, that provides a more active form of immunization, right? But if I'm vaccinating you with the hope of another individual benefiting from your vaccination, that is a form of passive immunity. So the latest information is that there are two vaccines now available on the market that target the preventing the infection in adults. Both vaccines are now available, whether it's a RexV or a Breezebo. A RexV is by GSK, which also has a vaccine for shingles. And a Breezebo, as you guys may be familiar with Pfizer, as the Pfizer COVID vaccine, Pfizer was one of the companies that produced the vaccine. So the difference between the two vaccines is that that will be important in a few moments when we talk about pregnant women, is the fact that the a BREXV vaccine has a special component um, that is patented by GSK. It is a component that's also present in their shingles vaccine. That comes into play when we talk about pregnant women in a moment as to why their BREXV vaccine is not available for pregnant or not approved yet for pregnant women. The other vaccine, which is a Breezevo, that's the one that is produced or manufactured by Pfizer, is the only one that is approved for pregnant women, but both are approved for older adults, 60 years and older. However, what's important to know is that there is no overall recommendation that all adults in these categories have to be vaccinated. Instead, the recommendation is for there to be a conversation with your healthcare provider as to whether or not you should receive the vaccine. So essentially, it is a shared decision making between you and your healthcare team. Keep in mind, similar to the COVID vaccine, as we learn, not everyone is going to mount necessarily the intended response to the vaccine and have sufficient protection. So especially if you're someone who may have an underlying condition that puts you at risk for not necessarily mounting the expected response to the vaccine, you definitely would want to have a conversation to weigh out the risk and benefits with your healthcare provider. And that community is are primarily those who have a compromised immune system, whether it's medication related or chronic disease related. So the Abrisvo vaccine, as mentioned, is recommended or is available for pregnant women between 32 to 36 weeks during the peak season. So this, similar to the influenza vaccine, is a seasonal vaccine and has really good response in terms of protection of the infant, which is the target, right? We're utilizing mom's body to produce antibodies to then pass, again, passive immunity, the antibodies onto her unborn child. And again, antibodies are proteins that are in the body that are responsible as a part of the immune system to recognize and to neutralize foreign invasion, whether it's bacteria or whether it's a virus. And that being said, I should take this moment to remind everyone that a virus is not effectively eradicated by the use of antibiotics. Antibiotics target bacterial infections. Only antivirals, which we're not talking about today, we're not talking about treatment for RSV, we're talking about prevention of severe disease of RSV, right? So, however, there are other viruses that actually have treatment options, um, such as the flu and such as COVID, there are antiviral medications that you can take to decrease the um, the severity of disease. So Breezefoa, as mentioned, is can be administered between 32 and 36 weeks. 
Here are some things that you should know about in trials that warrant further investigation. There may be an increased risk for preterm births, and there may be an increased risk for preeclampsia. Now, this information is very much uh, new information and warrants further evaluation to see if, from the initial trials, these risks are truly evident. Um, and truly substantial, and whether or not we should take precautions with those who may be at risk, for example, for preterm births or at risk for preeclampsia or other hypertensive disorders during pregnancy. Specifically, when it comes to the preterm birth outcome, uh, which was about 5.7% um, in those who were in the Abrisfor group versus 4.7% in the placebo group, this was this outcome was primarily seen in countries of low to middle income. So there is right now not enough data to really say whether or not there's a causation between the administration of the vaccine and the and the slightly uh, or imbalanced outcome of preterm births in the recipients of the Abrisbo vaccine. This vaccine can be administered between 32 and 36 weeks, which again, because of the gestational age of administration, it decreases the likelihood of someone experiencing preterm birth. Um, if you are concerned about that particular issue, you may wanna consider um, having the vaccine towards the end of, your, of that time frame. But that again, should be a discussion weighing the risk and benefits with your healthcare provider. Now, for those who are wondering, when are you preterm? You're preterm up until the end of your 36th week. Um, so up to 36 weeks and six days is still considered to be preterm. Full term starts at 37 weeks, specifically 37 and zero days is the market for full term for a full term pregnancy. There are also additional concerns regarding low birth weight and jaundice in newborns. Again, this is information that is very preliminary and warrants further evaluation to see if these rates are actually substantial and warrants intervention or concerns or precautions or eliminates any group from participating in the vaccination. So essentially stay up, stay updated, stay in tune with us, and we will try to update you as this information becomes more clarified as additional trials are conducted. There's also some concern for Guillain-Barre syndrome. So Guillain-Barre syndrome is a very rare complication that happens as a result of an actual infection, a viral infection, or sometimes can be associated with the vaccination. Um, it is unclear as again, whether or not this is a substantial concern for the administration of the RSV uh, vaccines that are now available. So again, stay in tune to make sure that you are updated when this information is clarified in the near future. So what happens if a mom happens to not be a candidate for vaccinations or decides that she doesn't want to be vaccinated, but is still concerned about the protection of her child? Well, you should know that there's additional option for the prevention of severe disease and hospitalization, which is really to go. We don't want anyone to get RSV, but we especially don't want anyone to have severe disease warranting hospitalization and the unfortunate um, outcome of death, right? That is really the primary goal. So if someone misses the time frame or happens not to be a candidate to receive the vaccine because of the timing of when the vaccine became available, but is still concerned about their child being protected against the infection, nosevimab is the newer monoclonal antibody therapy, but you should know there has been one that has been available for years. And so this is not new therapy. It's just that the one that was available before was primarily targeting the infants that were at the highest risk, the children that are at high, highest risk for severe disease. This newer monoclonal antibody therapy is now available for infants that are younger than eight months with one precaution. So there is a limited supply of this antibody, monoclonal antibody therapy. So there was a precaution or a news update that went out last month in October that notified the public that there is a limited supply of nirsevimab. And so keep that in mind when you are making your decision, especially as a pregnant woman, as to what your options are. So what's some of the findings between the two? Well, when you administer a vaccine to a mom, she then mounts an antibody response and passes the antibodies on to her unborn child. That is a form of passive immunity. Passive immunity via this method is 
shorter in duration, meaning the child would be protected at birth, which is great, but the duration of that protection is shorter than kids who receive the nirsevimab or other forms of monoclonal antibody therapy, because that form of immunization tends to last longer. So that's one of the difference between the two. Um, another notable difference from the initial clinical trials is that the vaccination of the RSV vaccine of Brisvo is a lot more resistant, resistant, no pun intended, but it is a lot more resistant to mutations of the virus. And so that is the difference between both types of immunizations. Also, you should know the, the Brisvo vaccine is a bivalent vaccine, which means it is protective against RSVA and RSVB. So you will learn that there are trivalent and bivalent vaccines will let you know how many viruses that vaccine targets. So pregnant women are now advised to receive the RSV vaccine, the influenza vaccine, and the Tdap vaccine. The Tdap vaccine primarily targets the infant. The RSV vaccine targeting the infant and the um, influenza vaccine, as well as the COVID vaccine, I should mention, are targeting decreasing the rates of severe disease in pregnant women who are considered to be at risk for severe disease. The RSV and the Tdap, or the vaccine that targets pertussis, are targeting helping the survival of the unborn child of that mom. So some people may be asking, can I get the RSV vaccine with the other vaccines? And the answer is yes. However, there was one study that indicate that there may be an impact in the amount of immunity mount with the against pertussis with the Tdap vaccine being co-administered. The Tdap vaccine can be administered anytime from the 27th week of pregnancy to the 36th week of pregnancy. And so you have the option to space out the vaccines so that you don't necessarily have to receive both vaccines at the same or multiple vaccines at the same time. You can space it out. Another key thing for you to know in terms of if I give birth the next day after the vaccine, is my baby protected? And the answer is that the recommendation in terms of the protection or the efficacy of the protection of the unborn child. So again, when mom gets vaccinated against the RSV virus, it protects the baby ideally at, from the time of birth. So, however, if mom gives birth in less than 14 days after receiving the vaccine, she may not have necessarily mounted sufficient immunity against the virus to protect her child. Uh, so keep that in mind. And the recommendation for the administration of the monoclonal antibody are for kids who are entering the RSV season for the first time. So it's their first RSV season. For kids who have risk factors for severe disease, there may be some consideration for giving a second administration of the, of the monoclonal antibody therapy, or Sevimab. Uh, that being said, also, there may be consideration for administration of the antibody of the monoclonal antibody therapy for patients who um, were born to moms who did receive the vaccine in very rare cases that may be considered for unique circumstances. So again, having ongoing dialogue with your provider is key to really understand what your risk factors are and what your benefits are potentially from receiving either of these therapies. So some of you may be wondering just how effective are these vaccines for the newborn? Well, one thing that you should know is that um, one of the trials for the Breezeville vaccine specifically, which included about 3,500 pregnant women. So these are pretty considerable size trials. Um, when they looked at the women who were administered the vaccine between 32 and 36 weeks of gestation, um, of which about 1,500 was within the Abrisfo group and about another 1,500 was in the placebo group. Uh, the result of that study showed a reduced risk of about 35% of infants acquiring the lower respiratory tract infection. Um, and there was a reduced risk of severe lower respiratory tract infection by 91% within 90 days after birth compared to the placebo. And within 180 days, after birth, the Abrisfo uh, reduced the risk of lower respiratory tract infection by about 57%, and then also reduced the risk of severe disease by 76%, 76.5%. So again, a very effective vaccine in targeting the outcome, which is safety and efficacy in reducing the acquisition of disease, which again help, helps the 
more communal spread of the infection, and also reduction in severity of disease, again, lowering the rates of hospitalization. And again, having these options help to reduce the potential risk of a triple damage, which would be COVID, flu, and RSV. It's really encouraging to see that the information is becoming not just more out there and more available, but also people are being a lot more transparent. There are parents who have had the experience of having a child affected with severe RSV disease and are more vocal about their experience, including those on social media who are influencers. So it's really important for this information to really get out, but it's also as some validity when someone who is of influence joins with the scientific community to prevent further impact of the infection. By sharing information, their personal experiences, and just adding the importance and voicing the importance of being aware of this infection. So thank you to all those who are stepping in front of the camera to be able to bring awareness to RSV and step into spaces of vulnerability by sharing their own experience. So once more, if you are trying to decide whether or not you should receive the single dose of Pfizer vaccine, which is a breezeville, if you are pregnant between the 32nd and 36th week of pregnancy, you should definitely have a conversation with your provider. If you're pregnant during those weeks, during the peak season or the season of RSV, um, for other individuals who are not pregnant within those weeks during the peak time of RSV, there is no recommendation for the vaccine in other groups. Um, so if you want any additional updated information, make sure that you stay in tune with our platform. We'll try to update you as much as we can. Tap into the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Medical Association, the um, your local health departments, as well as the CDC uh, for the most updated information regarding this particular vaccine, its efficacy, and if there are any precautions regarding it. So once again, this is Dr. T, the hand behind the handle of Healthy Bump Club right here on YouTube and the hand behind the handle of Healthy Bump dot club on Instagram. We thank you guys for watching. We hope this information has added to your already growing knowledge about RSV. And certainly if you have any comments or questions, feel free to drop your comments and questions in the comment section. We will be monitoring for that information. You should know that the CDC has ongoing surveillance, seasonal surveillance for RSV, just as it does for COVID, as well as the influenza virus. We hope this information was palatable for you. And also we hope that you would watch some of our other videos as we touch on the latest important topics. We thank you for supporting HBC and platforms similar to ours, who are really trying to balance the equity of healthcare and also improve the outcome for all people. Thank you guys for watching and we'll see you guys when next episode.